The Wutterfer star is possibly the weirdest star I have ever come across. Like, it is probably the most observed star in the history of astronomy, and yet even with all those observations, we still have no idea what it's doing. So the Wutterfer star is also known as Tabby star or Boyajan star, after Tabby Boyajan, who was the lead author on the paper in 2015, which announced that this star had been found by citizen scientists on the Planet Hunters project. This was a website that asked the public to classify data from the Kepler Space Telescope, which was observing stars' brightnesses. So when a dip in the star's brightness was seen, it could be an exoplanet transiting in front of that star. So basically people were asked to label where the dips were on light curves. Now these have probably already been looked at by computer algorithms, but you can only train a computer to look for what you know. You can only train it to look for what you expect to see. You can't train it to look for the weird things that you don't know are actually interesting. And that's where humans come along, because as soon as they see something that looks weird, they'll flag it. And that's what they did here with the Water First Star. They were seeing 30 day chunks of observations of its brightness. And people were flagging them as really strange or interesting or a giant transit, i.e. something that was like really, really long or really, really deep. And so the team then noticed that all these things that the volunteers were flagging were all from the same star. And instead of having very regular dips in brightness that were always the same depth because they were caused by a single planet just orbiting around its star and causing a dip in the brightness every, say, 10, 20 days, however long its year was, none of these transits were the same depth. None of them were the same length. They didn't seem to have any form of periodicity. Like, they were random. They didn't come every certain number of days. And it wasn't like there was one of the same depth every number of days with lots of little ones in between. There was no pattern to it at all. It looked completely random. And it wasn't like they were working with only a little bit of data here. It's not like it was like random statistics. This was four years worth of Kepler Space Telescope data, in which you had one dip that lasted four days, and yet you had one dip that was so deep it dipped the star by about 0.5% of its brightness, which doesn't sound like a lot, because, but if you think about it, planets are quite small with respect to their star, so they don't cause a huge dip in brightness, so 0.5% is actually really big for a planet transit. So Boyajan et al. in 2015 were the first paper to really describe this star, and they did try and look for some periodicity that, you know, couldn't be seen by the human eye when you're looking at the light curve, just because there's so much noise in there to dig through. But if you sort of process it with an algorithm and get out the difference between successive dips, you find that there is a peak at sort of a dip every 0.88 days. And that's a very, very short period. You know, if you have a planet, that would be very, very close into the star going very, very fast. So they said what they were seeing there was actually the star rotating. And so you're seeing all of the variability on the star's surface coming back every 0.88 days. You know, the same as we see for our sun, we get sunspots. And so as they rotate out of our view and into our view, we'll then get a, a period of that sunspot moving around the sun. Same thing as what they detected here, but that everything else was random still. So this star's actually in the constellation of Cygnus, pretty famous constellation, pretty easy to spot. It's the one that looks like the Swan and the Milky Way runs through it. But this star is about 1,400 light years away. So it's pretty faint. You can't see it with the naked eye. You need like a five inch telescope or above in a really dark sky to do it. But it does mean that this star had been observed way back in the 1890s once telescopes were good enough to spot it. And it's been observed ever since then except these were only like single observations. It wasn't like it was being observed, you know, sort of multiple times in a day, like what Kepler did, in order to be able to spot those dips in brightness and in variation and random periodicity that was going on. Which means it was one of those unknown knowns way up till 2015, something that we knew of, but didn't really know about. But people realised that studying these historic observations of the star could actually tell you more about it. And they've actually found that the average brightness of this star has actually dimmed over time since 1890. In fact, it's decreased its brightness overall by about 20%, which is unheard of for this kind of star of this mass, of this type. It means that it's dimming 
on average by about 0.34% every year. But because it was unheard of, it meant that people wondered, well, are stars of this specific type and mass all doing this? Are they all dimming? Is this weird or not? And so they studied 193 more stars of the same mass and type and found that none of those were undergoing this dimming. So this was another really strange property of the what of a star. There's also very recently been another paper come out, just last month, by Rappaport and collaborators, and they have found another star that's unexplicable as well. This one is called Epic 249706694. So this star had been observed in phase two of the Kepler mission, what was called K2. It was observed over 87 days, and in that time was found to transit 28 times. Again though, no period to it at all, they were completely random, except for this one, all of the transits were pretty much exactly the same depth, which again is very, very strange, but again, completely different to the Wutafa star. And so any hypothesis you come up to explain this kind of random dipping in the star's brightness, you also need to be able to explain why some of them might all be the same depth and some of them might all be completely different depths as well. So like a lot of unsolved mysteries, there are a lot of hypotheses floating around that try to explain what we're seeing with this star. The problem is that not all of them fit the data. And the thing is, a couple of years ago, people announced, oh, we've decided which one it is, but then more data came to light and it's gone back to being an unsolved mystery again. And the reason that so many have sprung up is because there's so much data on this star, not just the original four years worth of Kepler data, but once it was announced that it had been identified as a strange star, there was a shout put out to say, if you're at an observatory at any point, or if you're an amateur astronomer with a telescope, please observe the brightness of this star and report back. Please take a spectra of this star and report back and then send them to Tabby Boyajan so that she can go through them and figure out what is going on for this star. And with all of that data, it means that they've been able to rule out certain hypotheses. So one that was put forward, for example, was that there was this huge debris field around the star. So for example, maybe a collision between two planets had occurred, which had vaporized those planets, turned the molten, flung out a load of molten rock, which is then solidified into this sort of like debris cluster around the star. Thing is, if you have that, the star heats that material, that material starts to glow in the infrared, and so we can spot it. Now, people have constantly observed Tabby Star in the infrared and found that there's no infrared excess, they call it. The star itself will give out infrared and then you should see an excess of light around it, but that isn't there, so that rules out that sort of debris field theory. That also ruled out the favourite theory that was sort of agreed upon in 2017 and sort of announced to the world that it was this, like, field of comets around the star, very similar to like the Oort cloud in the solar system, but much closer into the star. And also by the notion that, you know, you need something that's gonna block 22% of the light from the star and comets aren't gonna do that. And then of course, the big thing that hit the headlines, aliens, it's never aliens. Little green men turned out to be rotating neutron stars, which we call pulsars. Quasars turned out to be accreting supermassive black holes. Gamma ray bursts turned out to be supernova. It's never aliens. But what if it's not? But what Bond Paper did suggest was that it could be this Dyson Swarm megastructure put into place by an alien civilization around their star to essentially draw power from it. You can imagine it as like a load of solar panels in a big array around the star that they would draw energy to power their civilization. But that was completely ruled out in 2017 by Mengen collaborators when they found that the dimming is actually wavelength dependent. So you get more dimming in the ultraviolet and you get less dimming in the infrared. That's really significant because you have any solid object, whether it is solar panel from an alien civilization or whether it is like a solid planetesimal or a moon or a planet or a comet, whatever, they would all block all wavelengths of light equally. They wouldn't cause wavelength dependent dimming. So essentially any theory that attributes all of these transits to anything larger than a dust particle got ruled out by the Mengetau result in 2017. So even though it's not aliens, SETI have still got it on its watch list. They've tried to see if they can detect radio signals or any sort of laser activity from the star. Nothing as of yet. Yet. 
So there are two theories then still up in the air that haven't really been ruled out yet by any other theory. One of them is this idea of dust around the star in sort of a cloud or a disc that's completely irregular, you know, it's very, very clumpy and the clumps cause the sort of dips in the star's brightness that look like a planet transit, but obviously they're randomly scattered so there's no periodicity to them and they're irregularly clumped so there's no pattern in how deep the transit is either. The thing is though, with the dust, we should have seen it in the infrared. So this idea of an infrared excess again, where you have the infrared light from the star and then you should see an excess around the star as well, which we haven't. We know some stars are dusty and have these sort of dips because of the dust, but they have an infrared excess. So it's really important that we keep observing it in the infrared. Perhaps it's just incredibly faint and we need better telescopes to see it, or perhaps it's not there, we don't know still more observations are needed. Then there's magnetic fields, the long running joke in astronomy that nobody understands magnetic fields, nobody ever considers magnetic fields, and everyone always forgets about magnetic fields. Well, the water for a star could be due to magnetic fields. If you have a very complicated magnetic field, it could affect how your star's outer atmosphere is cooling, what we call the photosphere. And so that could affect its brightness and cause this strange variability that would be completely unpredictable because magnetic fields are random and are completely unpredictable. And there are other known stars in the Kepler field that have been observed that are known to have very strong magnetic fields, and they have sort of strange variation in their brightnesses as well, but nowhere near as bad as Tabby star, the Wittifer star, with these ridiculously deep and random dips in brightness. So perhaps to verify that theory, we need to do some more simulations of a very extreme magnetic field around a star and see whether it can cause such extreme dips in the brightness like had been seen around the Wittifer star. The good news is that right now, from the 18th of June to the 11th of September, TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, which is the follow-up to Kepler, is actually observing the Wittifer star. And it's gonna be observing it every two minutes. That kind of high cadence observation is so important for, able, for us to be able to understand these dips in brightness, you know, from the very beginning to the very end of the dip in brightness, what really happens as the dip starts and ends? And can that give us clues to what's going on? Now there's no guarantee that we'll actually see a dip in brightness during that sort of four month period that Tess is observing it because they're completely random. We can't predict if one's gonna happen in that time. If there isn't a dip, then it's just a waiting game. It requires people on the ground to keep monitoring the star and seeing if it starts to dip in brightness. And if that happens, a big shout will be put out worldwide. Essentially, astronomers assemble, the Wittifer star is dipping again. We need as many observations as we can to try and figure out this unsolved mystery. Did another paper come out by Rappaport? 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 No, Rappaport. Report. Like the transiting exoplanet search. Transiting exoplanet survey satellite. And the reason that's. And the cool thing is that. And the cool thing is. And the cool thing is, since it was first spotted. And the cool thing is that.